Thank <laughs> you.
Highly acclaimed work includes The Thousand Faces of the Night, which won the Com Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book in 1993. The short story collection, The Art of Dying, the novels, The Ghost of Possum Master, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Siege and Fugitive Histories, and a collection of essays entitled Almost Home, Cities and Other Places, she has also written children's stories and edited a collection of uh, translated short fiction, A Southern Harvest, the essay collection from India to Palestine, essays in solidarity and co-edited Battling for India, a citizen's reader. Hariharan has over the years been a cultural commentator through her essays, lectures and activism. In 1995, Hariharan challenged the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act as discriminatory against women. The case Geeta Hariharan and another versus Reserve Bank of India and another led to a landmark Supreme Court judgment in 1999 on guardianship. We warmly welcome uh, um, you to the introductory remarks, Madam. We welcome you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to plunge in um, and start by saying that the good thing about introductory remarks um, is that I can um, uh, pretend I don't have to do all the work, um, which, you know, of, of actually talking about uh, the writing and the publishing. Uh, which is a sensible thing because with people like um, uh, Zai and Paro and Radhika and, um, you know, any number of others around uh, Cairo Nisa, um, I really would not uh, dare to hold forth on exactly how to uh, write for children. Um, but like all those who don't practice the craft, I have a lot of opinions. Uh, on the subject. So, uh, you know, let me uh, uh, let me start um, uh, uh, with going back to first principles, which is we're all talking about the child and children as if that is one nice homogeneous group. Um, uh, even when we say Indian children, you know, um, I, I'd like to uh, know what this, this homogeneous beast is. Uh, so perhaps we should, the introductory remarks should sort of, you know, when you're playing the game of carom and you suddenly do a wild shot and everything goes haywire, maybe that's where we should start. Um, uh, pose a, a set of questions, create a certain doubt uh, so that we can go back to first principles and talk about the fact that things are not always what they seem, whether we are talking about children, whether we're talking about literature, or whether we're talking about reading and writing. I'm not getting into publishing. There are too many writers in this group, and we are going to pretend that the publishers belong on the other side. Um, so let me start with saying, well, what is childhood? And why am I asking this? This is not really a facetious question. Because if you look at the idea of childhood over a, uh, a historical period, um, how did people see children, you know, some centuries back? And it's not just a question of time, but we are also looking at different cultures. Um, how do different cultures uh, see childhood? In other words, I'm pointing out the fact, the well-known, uh, much discussed and well-researched fact that perhaps we should ask ourselves constantly about to what extent childhood is a social construct. 
um, something not only really created and defined by a particular time in society, but in a way, if I listen to what your idea is of a child and what a child needs, the minute you start talking about what a child needs and put on your uh, white coat and pull out your stethoscope um, to make sure, ensure uh, the child's health, either as a teacher or as a policymaker, um, we might already be able to identify where you're coming from. You see, so your framework, your view of childhood um, might say a great deal about, um, uh, you know, what you would do for children in terms of literature or anything else. Um, and this is not just uh, going back to history. If you look at uh, this morning's um, Indian Express, uh, there is discussion on the data protection bill. And um, uh, there is debate about the uh, definition of a, a child. What is the age at which a child stops being a child? Um, that's important, too, because uh, this is uh, consent in, in legal terms, uh, in terms of data protection. And uh, it says something that it's the social media uh, uh, companies that are very anxious to reduce the age of consent so that childhood is fast forwarded so that they can actually go on social media. And um, whether it's in Europe, America, there are different notions of, you know, 16 is when you stop being a child. In India, it's 18 right now and so on. So I just want to place that there, that at one point, children were considered uh, mini adults. They were dressed like mini adults. They were you know, put out to work, of course, depending on class um, uh, as, as many adults and so on. But let's look at it today. The, the dominant, what is the dominant narrative on childhood, though it's absolutely by no means the only lived experience of childhood, but the dominant narrative on childhood is a fairly recent one, which is that it's a golden time of innocence and happiness. You know, um, and uh, uh, this is a time when you're in the protective cocoon of the family circle. And uh, there's been some argument that this is a very Western notion. But of course, uh, you might have people in India saying that we've always had uh, the idea of the large family uh, or the community and a time when the uh, uh, child is is protected and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, cross. what I want to say is that the different experiences of childhood, depending on the times, the location, the class, the community, the gender, and of course, the intersection of some of these factors, where children take responsibility from an early age. Um, uh, Zai is here, um, you know, she, she will give the participants very concrete examples of um, communities that we don't necessarily consider either when we are writing for children or making policies uh, for children or publishing for children. Um, so what happens um, in communities where there's less of a, of a constructed dividing line between children and adults? Um, I just want to sort of parenthetically mention those might also be communities where there's less of a, a, a constructed dividing line between human beings and the world of animals and nature. But that is just something I, I want to place somewhere in the background um, for people like Zai to pick up. So the important thing to remember is that it's not that children are actually different now than they were at any point in the past. We constantly hear people saying, oh, children today are so smart. Well, I, I really don't hold with that because I don't think I'm any smarter than my great, you know, great grandmother. Um, I think we are as stupid and as smart as our ancestors were. We just in different contexts. So it's not that the children are any different. Um, and we're not even going to say that different from each other, whether they're in a middle class family in the city or a family struggling to live, having been displaced from their traditional location in the forest. 
It's the ways in which society perceives childhood that it changes in different times and cultures and places and contexts. Um, we are also constantly reevaluating, um, therefore, what uh, children should be given and what they should be protected against. Um, and later, perhaps, uh, we can get to that uh, in terms of looking at some of the classic, classic children's texts that are being reevaluated today um, for their um, views on race or gender or sexuality or the um, colonized and the uh, colonial and so on. I, I speak as somebody who, as a child, I used to wait for um, uh, my father to bring home the newspaper uh, with the Phantom comic. And uh, it was deeply depressing to later find out that um, where we, people like us, figured in this in this um, uh, fabricated world of phantom. Um, and there are any number of examples. So the stray remarks and suggestions that I'm going to stick my um, neck out and make about reading and writing children's literature, you have to view in this context of shifting multiple views of the child and of childhood itself. Um, in other words, the key word I'm going to suggest is balance. Balance in writing for children, publishing for children, um, and so on. So, okay, our views of childhood, I think we are all pretty much the consensus is that there is a period of nurturing, but also a period of preparation to, you know, fly away from the nest into the real world. So both the nurturing and the preparation have to look for a balance between total disconnectedness from adult life and total connectedness. You know, the law anyway gives us some sort of framework um, about protecting the children uh, from old and new forms of outright abuse, but also the gray areas and so on. You know, and obviously with technology, with uh, changes in education, uh, with new crises in, in our uh, sociopolitical uh, context, all these will change. Now, I'm going to ask a fundamental question here that I hope uh, the participants will um, engage with and, and quiz the actual practitioners um, about, which is when we say nurturing, you know, the word protection is always a loaded word. All of us women know what it is to be protected. It generally means it is to be controlled. OK, so uh, right away, I want to say, let's please not talk about children's literature as that pill, you know, the sugar coated pill with bitter medicine inside because this world of terrible adults um, has decided that this is what children must be told. Well, of course, no wonder they don't believe your story at all. And no wonder that, you know, the 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 so-called wicked stories of Saki or Roald Dahl are so attractive. Um, because, of course, um, uh, you know, any little child knows that there's a power structure in the world. And for the little child, it's the adult who holds the strings and is, is the power structure. So um, I, I think it's human nature to immediately feel that, um, you know, you're going to struggle against the existing power equation. So children are very quick to, to sniff out the didactic, to sniff out anything that smells of the syllabus in literature. And of course, we can go into that. Um, it, it really alarms me when people think uh, literature is some sort of mission. It's not, um, whether it's for adults or children. Um, it does other things, but we can talk about, you know, why we bother to create this and why we bother to partake of it. So I think there are two big questions that are interlinked. What does protection mean? To what extent is it control? Does it mean that you're going to keep the child in a tower to be kept safe, a la Rapunzel? Does a didactic literature 
which feed you values, desirable views of the world, or our great minds in the corridors of power, which give us education policies. I, I, uh, I have a feeling, Kartika, I won't be invited back. Um, but does this fall into the class of protection that hinders what literature is meant to do? So what does nurturing mean? Let me let me uh, do my version of policy making, and um, you know all those those. Um, I used to be an editor, and we always had something called an executive summary for the very important people in the world who can't read entire reports, and we would give them bullet points. So, as they were sort of being driven to an important meeting, they could quickly uh, uh, look at these bullet points and make suggestions. So I think that the primary, primary thing is questions. Discovery through questions. So what are you doing? You're really, you're not giving them information. Nothing we write is going to give them the kind of information that they can get not only from direct experience and observation of the world, but also uh, for, for those of a certain class and access to and uh, the the uh, uh, online world or the, the world of libraries and so on, they have more than enough information. What they require is judgment skills. OK, so it's not so much that we're going to sort of, you know, put values there. And um, because, of course, even all of us friends will argue about what are the values that are most important. And rather than looking for a lowest common denominator, judgment skills, but always presented with multiple value systems. Um, and what is, how do you do that? I think primarily connections with other children, other people and places. So you always have, oh, people like me, you know, which is really important, especially for those of us who've been colonized. And um, so that you don't have to grow up thinking, that my God, there's nobody who looks like me or sounds like me or speaks the languages I do or, you know, and so forth. So people like me, but people who live different lives as well, because how boring to only look at yourself in the mirror. So that is one balance. Then the balance between real life and fantasies. I think children or adults, uh, a, a life without fantasy is, is you know, useless. It's um, it's it's really important. It's even important uh, in not just as adventures of the imagination, but a lot of things that bother you, a lot of situations that are difficult to see it in an invented landscape um, gives you the distance and it's comfortable. So the same problems that you might face, the same grief and loss and whatever, or the joys, but to see it somewhere else. Uh, the ambivalences of life, you know, uh, to see it in an invented landscape. Fantasy does that beautifully. But real life cannot be escaped. And it's foolish to pretend that our children are somehow exempt from that. This is a, a, a great pretense. And that is, of course, the real challenge. And there are people here uh, today in your panel who will actually uh, talk to the participants about how you might achieve this balance, how you might talk about real life, um, and to what extent your desire to protect the child might end up being somewhat dishonest. So that is there. It's not so much a question of making it palatable, but working it into this uh, form you have, which might be uh, 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 fiction, which might be poetry, and so forth. I think connections with nature also important, but not romanticized. Um, I, I want to point out my own experience um, as, as a teacher of children, which is with my sons when they were growing up. Um, I must say that I, I learned along with them. And some of those wonderful old books we used to have about, for example, what we learned from bats, you know, the kind of um, not just how to make things, but how uh, man-made things, human-made things have emerged from what um, uh, uh, are made in nature. Uh, so without romanticizing, 
um, you know, if we take a kind of approach of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who was very good at going to nature and not only looking at the um, at the leaf with a microscope, but looking at how things are built um, in nature uh, uh, or, you know, looking at like Salim Ali, looking at the world of birds and 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 getting ideas about uh, human life f uh, from nature. So there's a link with nature. The other balance, of course, is between the Indian, quote unquote, and the foreign. And there, of course, you have to um, talk about myth and tale and modern. Um, I think uh, it's really important to achieve a balance there because uh, while the tales, uh, you know, are, what shall I say, the uh, whether it's the Panchatantra or the Mahabharata or the Ramayana and Silapadikaram and so forth, or the tales, it's like the Grimm's fairy tales. These are really not children's literature, but they've always been packaged as, um, you know, adapted uh, children's literature. So uh, that might be an interesting uh, area of research for those who want to research on children's literature. Uh, think about how even Ringa Ringa Roses is actually talking about the plague and how does it get sanitized and domesticated into something uh, so fearful that they've reduced it to something which is a children's tale, you know, which is giving you a, a feeling, a whiff of uh, non-reality, that it's just it's just a, be a monster in the dark. It's not real. OK, so it might be interesting to see a, a collective kind of uh, pretense that something is only for children, that it's not real. As many people will tell you that stories are only for children, you know, so it's almost as if you are afraid of the power of stories and you diminish its value and say it's only for uh, children, um, which, of course, is is also one way of making sure you can violate freedom of speech because storytellers are always dangerous uh, since they have trouble behaving. Uh, the other, I think, really important uh, thing to consider is annotation. How do you frame stories in less authoritative ways um, about different times? Uh, um, you know, a, a lot of older stories, it's like going to an art exhibition because we don't know a thing about what we're looking at. Um, somebody will write a, a catalog and tell you how to look at it. So uh, do we really want that? And sometimes it's very useful because context is very important. So if we have somebody who uh, um, do you want to throw out Enid Blyton, for example, because she has a gollywog, you know, or do we uh, frame that and say, look, this is what it was um, so that the children don't have to come to this on their own. Uh, in other words, talking about different power structures, treating children as intelligent beings without making it like a horror film, which, of course, power structures often are subject for a, a horror film. So let me let me uh, I'm going to make a few uh, concluding remarks and maybe they can be questions because I don't want to bore on forever. I, I've made a few points as concluding remarks. One is that things are not always what they seem. And this, of course, all the writers here, and I'm sure most of the readers here know, is kind of one of the first principles of what we do. Things are not always what they seem. And that is how we live in this crowded place called India. And this is how we live in a multilingual country, you know, driven by class, caste, gender, community divisions, um, people in the forest, people in the, you know, so multiplicity, in other words, context, uh, and how to view that as having problems, but also riches. Um, so difference, but layers as well, not just multiple screens. And I think one of the ways in which to uh, I would approach if I were smart enough to write for children is to try and remove the walls, not have adults speaking down to children, 
um, because it's been my experience that children are very canny about people <laughs> talking down to them. Um, not think in terms of a mission. Um, uh, God knows uh, we all read enough adult uh, adult literature which, where you can smell the mission on practically the first page. And after that, you know, you've sort of lost interest. Um, so it's not mission or even talking about values. Values have to appear there organically. You know, when you, your worldview will have values embedded in it. Um, so it's not lessons. We have to withhold the temptation to shape and control and dictate and preach. In other words, the terrible interference of adults to deal with children, control, power, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, the most powerful tool, the most powerful tool, um, and I'm looking at Zai very enviously here, is humor, laughter, astringency. I think children love that walking the edge, you know, um, so something which seems just a little wicked, uh, you know, uh, a little irreverent, uh, which is, of course, a terribly healthy thing anyway. If you want policy, it's one hell of a good thing for all human beings to develop. Um, maybe if all of us had been taught with greater humor, and, um, you know, great astringency that I'm telling you this, but you don't have to believe it all. Go test it out for yourself. Maybe we would live in a better world. So but I want to end by saying by no means is the best children's literature just for children. And um, uh, the world is absolutely littered with um, work that you can read as a child. Uh, the classic example, since we are talking syllabus and textbook, is um, I remember reading uh, the Lilliput part of Gulliver's Travels as um, a children's tale. And of course, as I grew up, uh, this Lilliputian world of Gulliver's Travels uh, grew and assumed huge political, philosophical dimensions. So... Um, and in a, a more contemporary example, of course, um, I think Salman Rushdie's best work is Harun and the Sea of Stories, because um, it is a parable not only about storytelling and the right to hear stories and the right to tell stories, but also for the right of stories to belong to everybody, regardless of age, and for them to hear whatever makes sense in the world they live in. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Brilliant much. one. I totally enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And now uh, we can have some time for Q&A. Uh, right, so somebody has raised. Um, Vyoma Keshi, Vyoma Keshi, would you like to ask her the question? I'll just enable your mic. Then you have to... Uh, unmute and morning, speak. Can you? Good morning, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, this is Vyoma. I have recently submitted my PhD thesis in Usmania University in the very field of children's literature. And I'm very happy that uh, after Geeta ma'am's uh, uh, so-called, uh, what I can call actual address, it's no address. I'm so happy that I have a lot of questions putting across my mind, which I would like to put across to you, ma'am. Uh, I am novice uh, in this field, but I had some questions in my mind while I was doing my PhD thesis too. So hoping that I can get uh, answers so that I can do much better later. One question, uh, when you started talking about what a child and the construct, the social construct of the child, I was reminded very quickly of uh, St. Exupery's uh, uh, quote that all uh, grown-ups were once children, but the problem is that they forget that they were children. And um, as such, because I looked into post-coloniality of children's literature, you also have mentioned that there is some agency of adult literature, always adult mindset running across when we write for children. The same problem I encountered where I wanted to include a part of those writings in my thesis where I couldn't get at least a few of them that I can include that were written by children and actually what interests children as such. 
So the one question is, when we write for children, when we do not really, and imagination and responsibility and valuing relationships becomes very important for children, which as adults, when we write for them, how far do you think that we are able to write and recreate a world that children would definitely at least not see, would at least put a consonance to what they think is what we are writing? That is one of my questions. And uh, and and. Uh, how can we really, being an adult, write in such a way that children definitely would uh, love to read? <laughs> okay. Um, let me, I think you pretty much, uh, the answers are all in, in whatever answers I'm capable of giving uh, are already there in what I've said. Um, I, I don't think that you should, um, the world is already too full of binaries, um, uh, male and female, straight and uh, uh, whatever else. And, um, you know, let's let's not uh, give um, reinforce this this alleged line between adults and children. Um, so it's not so much that children are another species and we have to find out what they secretly want. Um, uh, I think <laughs> just like adults, children are perfectly um, capable of um, expressing their interest and their fascination, and they do. So it's not some kind of crisis. Um, you know, uh, how what you write and how successful you are in engaging, uh, not teaching or taking over the mind of uh, the reader, but engaging uh, uh, you know, with with the reader is is one of the great questions. Um, and if we knew the answer to that, uh, both writers and publishers would be very happy. But we don't. Why? Because all of us have different writing voices and all of us have different needs in terms of what we're looking for when we read. So um, I don't think we should worry so much about uh, I think we worry less about the uh, readership and just write um, as if you're writing for intelligent beings. Um, I think that will, you know, um, you have to you have to speak. What shall I say to the honest person inside? Because you say that we've forgotten the um, child. I I don't think so. I think um, we very carefully keep that child uh, covered because it would be very bad behavior, considered very bad behavior if if we brought out the child in us and and uh, let the world view it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are sort of uh, sanctioned ways of uh, expressing your not childishness, sometimes childishness, but also your childlike sense of wonder, um, your childlike uh, greed for experience, your childlike need um, for affection or connection with other people. I'm just faffing, but really what I'm trying to say is that this is not something one should overthink. I think the more spontaneous one is, the less, um, what shall I say, uh, directions and syllabus and norms you have, the better. Um, so, of course, I'm messing up your workshop, but um, uh, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> You would like to add that it should be less didactic and more uh, and more of a uh, what you can do. Bringing the child out of us is what we would like oh, to forget focus less, on. Forget less didactic, not didactic <laughs> at all. My dear, okay. you're very young, but those of us who are mothers here will tell you that we used to have a lot of theories about child rearing till we had children. Um, and, and of course, the minute you've had a child, um, you know, you know that whatever you do is wrong. <laughs> So, so all you can do is say, OK, today, I think this is the right thing in the context of today and in the context of the situation. You know, that's all. So a certain honesty with yourself and a sense of humor towards yourself. You know, you have to be kind to yourself as a writer also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, over to you, Tusha Baneka. Would you like to unmute and speak? Yep. Thank you, so yeah. Sure, sure. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. Perfect. You are. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, new perspective on children literature, ma'am. And uh, I simply have two questions in my mind. One, 
as you defined already you talked about can we really um, you know uh, can childhood be really confined to one definite meaning you said no to it but i would like you to elaborate it a little more and second what is what are your views on perhaps uh, the new generation or the young generation that we have as parents you know uh, where you have lot of exposure from different agencies like cocoa melon you might see that so and there is everywhere we see that parents are using it as one of the agencies to teach their children perhaps as a negligence i would uh, put it in the, that manner but what is what is your view on this particular agency and how does it impact children's i would say behavior or perhaps even their living as such now but you have to repeat what the agency is i haven't un- quite uh, there, there is a particular youtube channel called coco melon and in which there are nursery rhymes which have been given by uh, or created content created by uh, the company uh, which includes okay. all the english nursery rhymes particularly and they are being watched by almost every kid in india i would say or all over the world okay okay well i live in happy ignorance um <laughs> because luckily when i was bringing up my children there was no youtube and their idea of heaven was that i would tell them stories but um uh, actually what they wanted was childhood stories so lest you think i was making up very imaginative stories they really wanted um uh, you know real life childhood stories preferably where i was made a fool of um this is what i meant about uh, power structures that you know you love the idea about your all powerful mother or father uh, sort of you know metaphorically speaking uh, slipping on a banana peel um and uh, it's very important to teach children that it's okay to laugh at the powers that be you know um it, so that that's all right but uh look i'm not going to comment on um uh, parents uh, uh, you know sort of using cartoons on television or youtube or uh the ipad and so forth as babysitters okay um we live in such complex times when i think of uh, the the whole covid experience and the lockdown and so on, so on um we have to take into consideration how difficult it was uh for parents as well um particularly for mothers um so you know you can we can sit here and and sort of very virtuously say uh that they, you know they shouldn't be sitting in front of a screen all the time and so forth um and of course this is common sense to the extent that um uh, that if they can children should be out there uh making a mess in the real world um so i i think that's that's obvious about um where i do want to say something is that uh there's a lot of parents i don't know whether it's just today or we're just noticing it today who are so fearfully ambitious for their children to gain a certain kind of literacy um and to say oh my god you know she read she can read two books a day you know as if it's some sort of uh, uh sports event or uh you know i have little children coming and saying to me oh i my magic i i'm really quoting this i'm not making it up uh my mother tells me my, i have a wild imagination and i should be a writer for god's sake i mean why should um why should you tell you <laughs> you know what he or she is you know should be or uh, honestly i mean of course it's it's nice to admire what your child is capable of so look i am not going to uh, parenting is a difficult task and um it's hard enough for us to to write uh, for children and for, um <laughs> i don't think i should be advising parents on um how to bring up their children but to say as you would to a friend um you know try and uh, show them as many parts of the real world as you are capable of seeing and that is the real a uh, part to be underlined to expect your children to read and to enjoy literature when they never see you reading or enjoying literature but you know why should that happen um children imitate and even when they uh, we assume we'd like to assume that even after they've gone through a period of rebellion 
that whatever they, they um, internalized during those early formative years will surface uh, when they're older. Uh, this is what we hope uh, as far as secular worldview is concerned. And I think the same way, uh, uh, because this is armor to deal with the world. The, uh, this is uh, weapons to deal with real life, you know, reading um, and uh, listening to music, watching films and so on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Tushar, I think she has answered your question. Let me just move on to Shivangi. Shivangi, could you be quick in asking your question? I'm just allowing mic for you. You can unmute and ask. Shivangi, can you unmute and ask? Or shall I proceed to the next person? I think she has some issues. Uh, Rajita? Could you please try unmuting and uh, asking your question? Hi. Hi. You need to unmute. Unmute, please. Yes, you need to unmute. No, you are still on mute. Please press that mic button. Unmute. Are you able to? Uh, by the time, can I ask? Now my mic is unmuted. I'm All Shivangi. right, so go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Shivangi. Meanwhile, uh, Regita, please try to sort it out. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, you said that uh, many a times, um, texts which are not exactly meant for children are repackaged and adapted as children's literature. So is there a politics behind it? Like what all texts are uh, repackaged as children's literature? And another thing, this is related with this question, uh, is that uh, as adults, we know what are the narratives behind certain texts or what are the hidden meanings behind such texts? Because as you said, uh, uh, the Lilliputian world grew up as you grew. So uh, how is it like how much uh, correct is it on part of adults to feed children certain stories uh, after whitewashing it? So are we at some fault when we hide certain uh, dark realities of life and feed children and let them discover it as they grow up? And then they will feel that, oh, my childhood was all a lie. First, I have to apologize because, you know, I'm holding, holding forth here like an expert. But really, all my answers are quite really based on common sense. Um, and uh, they're not really complete answers anyway. Uh, so you've asked several questions. Uh, one is about um, uh, the how over a period of time uh, you have, um, you know, a story like the mermaid story, for example, Hans Christian Andersen, if you really read uh, what that story was all about, uh, it's quite a painful story. Or, as I said, the Ringa Ringa Roses. Now, I don't think that uh, was uh, a case of, you know, uh, some nasty adult um, uh, sitting down there and saying, you know, let's sanitize this and clean it up. That's how it evolved over a period of time. Um, and um, again, this is a subject for some of our um, inquiring participants to research how did how did this happen and um, uh, uh, you know for example uh, we know uh, that a lot of the uh, the stories from the Arabian Nights the thousand and one nights um, were uh, translated into sort of semi fantasy lit and semi children's lit if you like by people like uh, Rich Burton, Richard Burton and so on for the, for the European readership. And again, this come, brings me back to what I was talking about, the invented landscape, that a lot of uh, real life situations and questions could be addressed, um, not answered, but could be addressed uh, in this rather fantastical um, landscape and situation. Uh, and that is something we continue to do. I wrote a novel called When Dreams Travel, which is actually uses the Shahrazad story. So, um, you know, this is this is a kind of common legacy that we all have. 
So it's not a question that adults are sitting there and, you know, saying how you have to read it. And we living in India should know this so well because of our um, uh, multiple takes on the two epics that some dreadful creatures sit in their um, uh, uh, not so ivory towers, unfortunately, and say, this is the authoritative, uh, authoritative version of the Ramayana, or this is how the Mahabharata has to be read. You know, you look around, you read folk stories, you read written stories about whether it's Ravana or Sita or um, uh, any of the characters in Mahabharata, and you will find a perplexing and astonishing and delightful variety. You know, from the completely matter of fact, such as why did Ravana kidnap uh, Sita? Because apparently she was a damn good cook, and we all know how valuable good cooks are. Uh, and uh, what did Sita think of, um, you know, uh, being exiled to the forest? She was deeply relieved because then she'd have to wear a sari of bark and she didn't have to worry about the fashions in Ayodhya. They were all laughing at her otherwise, you see. So you have, there's always uh, not just the story, but the entire framing, the difference of framing you have between the tale, which is telling you how to live. Yar essay hota hai, just now carry on, you know. So something very practical. And then, of course, the grand myth which is trying to give you norms that this is how women must behave. This is how the lower caste must behave. This is how those who live in the forest must behave. And then, but somewhere sneakily, they'll say, this is how you must break the rules also. You know, so it's uh, uh, tales, uh, the body of tales fills over. It doesn't always behave. And we are not, uh, just as we think we're in control of nature, just because we are able to destroy it. It doesn't mean we're in control of of what with of the world of stories, just because some fellows come and say, this is the story. This is what you have to follow. And these are the rules of society coming out of a story. I don't know if I'm being um if I'm being too cryptic, but I think if I'm any less cryptic, I'm going to get into even more trouble than I already have in. Dr. Rajita, can you unmute yourself now and ask your question? Still not possible. OK, I'm going to make your presenter so you will be able to. Uh, can you try now? Yes, it's working now. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. OK, yeah. okay thanks. Uh, Geeta, ma'am, it's an absolute delight listening to you this morning. And uh, thank you so much for all these responses also. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm glad that you mentioned Harun in the Sea of Stories as a classic example of children's literature. Uh, so I was thinking about these two books. Uh, one is uh, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis, uh, which I teach. So I was thinking uh, it, it uh, it's a great text that uh, straddles different genres. You cannot put it into one box. It's autobiography. It's a lot of things too, right? So um, I don't know if one can call it children's literature as such because it also shows uh, the growing up, uh, the, a child, uh, I mean, the author is revisiting her own childhood and the child is a character in the book. And there are a lot of complexities that the child is grappling with, right? So uh, there is, uh, it is, uh, there's no fantasy as such, but it is social realism. Mm. It's also psychological realism. Uh, it's also, um, you know, an eye opening uh, for the adult to see the mind of the child. And similarly, another text that I was reading recently was Annie Salim's Small Town Sea which uh, you know in which there is uh, again similar conditions of complexities of growing up grappling with you know uh, different circumstances and the adults have no idea what is going on in the mind of the child so uh, unlike uh, the discussion that we had so far you know it's not the children that we are actually aiming at it's also for adults to understand childhood and its many many complexities so i just wanted to know your take on you know, these kind of issues Absolutely. I I mean, I'm, uh, I may not be a writer for children, but I'm, you know, uh, uh, I read uh, whatever comes uh, my way. Um, and uh, let, let me sort of divide this into two uh, strands. One is 
you know, I think of something like uh, Zai's Cobra in my kitchen. Um, now, you know, in real life, I'm, I'm terrified of uh, snakes. Um, and I have no idea how, um, uh, uh, you know, Zai can <laughs> be friendly with them, either in real life or in literature. But I love the idea of, of and especially if it's a sort of, you know, um, poetry is, is always something that it's like music, right? Uh, all of us enjoy it. And as for humor, so this is something you enjoy uh, reading, which is why you have the adult limerick and, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, in a way close to that. So there's that aspect uh, that we all enjoy. Uh, I think, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your age. Um, and in fact, I think as you get older, you find yourself remembering uh, some of the rhymes of a childhood. Um, quickly, I must point out here uh, in parentheses that they're not always sweetness and light, um, uh, because if you remember some of the rhymes we uh, heard in childhood, you know, for example, who's going to be the den when you're playing a game? Um, uh, in India, anyway, uh, in South India, to be particular, I remember several which are either anti-Muslim or anti um, uh, a particular caste. Uh, so, you know, uh, that that person's going to be the dead. Now, the idea of as adults, what do you you as a child, you don't know. But as adults, it's important to be aware of that. So that when you say, oh, my family never had any, you know, casteist church thing, we never thought of caste, etc. Well, naturally, because it was all embedded in this, this kind of, you know, childishness, quote unquote. OK, so that's one one trend, the wonder of it, but also the awareness of what is coded there in terms of history or in terms of prejudice um, and or in terms of earlier uh, forms of, of harmony and syncretism. OK, so that's one aspect of it. The I think the other aspect is whether you are an adult or a child, um, if you read uh, Paro Anand's uh, work on, say, Kashmir, um, you know, uh, uh, we really want to know uh, why don't you and I want to know what is uh, what the world looks like um, from the point of view of, of the child who opened um, a, a window and had a, a, a pellet, a rubber pellet hit her. You know, we want to know what that is. We want to know what life is like for. So it's this is just uh, a, what shall I say? Is a hope. What is? What do we have? Uh, what can we? You know, how how do we travel to the world of that child? So it doesn't matter whether you're writing for children or adults. We want to read that as long as it's done. Uh, truthfully and imaginatively. Similarly, uh, Zai just published a book called Termite Fry. I, I don't know whether I would call it a book for adults or children because um, its aspirations are wonderful for children um, and uh, it, it, it says a lot to adults as well. So uh, I would say that, you know, really it depends on the skill of the, um, of the uh, writer and uh, the, is this a story that that accommodates this inclusive audience? That's what I would say. Not all stories do. Not all stories should. But does a particular story, whether the person had a child or an adult in mind, does it accommodate the uh, readers of different ages? Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, actually, we are uh, we are just at the end of it. Like the time has just flew. I didn't really realize that. Eleven thirty, uh, ma'am. Should we take one more question? Because somebody was asking for so long. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Mangai, can you just unmute and ask your question? Please make it crisp and quick. Can you unmute? Yes. Speak. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. There could be some problem with the mic. Yes, can you speak now? Okay. All right. Uh, Himabala, would you like to ask instead? Can you try? 
Okay, Manga is typing her question, ma'am. I will read it out. Um, one more question was there related to the Kashmir uh, thing that you have just mentioned. What is the case of children who live in the war zones? Um, how can literature be some kind of therapeutic? I mean, can have some therapeutic effect on them. Monisha has asked that question, ma'am. Case mm -hmm. of children living in the war zone and literature being therapeutic. Well, we can only speculate. Um, I'm sure uh, the uh, others here will have uh, views on this. Um, I would think that uh, the idea of having somebody to talk to, either through story or image, um, however difficult it is, but somebody not only to talk to, but somebody to listen to your story uh, might be very useful. I am going to use uh, 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 an example, which is not strictly speaking about literature, but um, the uh, uh, wonderful artist Vasudha Torur had a long tenure project um, called uh, uh, in the aftermath of 2002 in Gujarat, what what would help some of these uh, uh, children, uh, uh, girl children, she um, chose uh, to work on this project. And she called the project Himmat. And how were you going to get Himmat, which is courage, through friendship? And how is this, what is the medium of this friendship to be? In that case, it was uh, for the children themselves to paint and draw, uh, but either real landscapes that they knew or wishful landscapes. Uh, but, you know, literature could perhaps perform the same therapeutic function. I say perhaps because to, to overstate the, the, uh, uh, the uses uh, of, of uh, uh, literature uh, is also not a good idea. I think broadly we can uh, arrive at a consensus that literature, whether it is for children or for adults or whether in conflict zones or regular day-to-day -day conflict zones, um, it's really to give you another grip on reality, you know, um, another way to understand the world you're living in. Uh, another way to extend the world you're living in. Um, I really uh, would hesitate to to uh, to claim more for literature, though sometimes we we would like to imagine we can do more. <laughs> okay, ma'am, uh, there have there are several questions coming up actually. I'm I think yeah. I'll I'll. I'll post it to you and maybe you can, if you get some yes. time, if you write yes. them down, I'll share well, it with I, the participants. I see that Mangai, Mangai says, I create content for school yes. English textbooks. Um, and I'm curious about a question because I used to, as a young woman, I used to work in a publishing house and I, I did um, uh, edited textbooks myself. So I'm curious about her experience. Um, but she has not, she so, hasn't typed it. Uh, Mangai has written, do you think not having these questions at the end of every lesson will bring children closer to uh, closer to reading stories and literature? Rather, does this whole idea of assessment drive away children from stories? She wanted me to ask you this. Mangai has asked this. She creates content. Yeah, but I haven't I haven't seen textbooks for a while, and my own experience was that, especially in the social studies uh, texts, um, and now it might seem, uh, you know, like talking about ye olde days to to our uh, audience, but we had to sort of sneak in uh, stuff where the mothers weren't always, you know, cooking, and um, uh, and and girls weren't uh, sort of treated with great scorn and so forth. Um, and of course, there's much more complexity in the in the in the world that is visible to the child today. And so those complexities have to be taken into account we, because we talk about diversity, but that has to be there in the textbooks. But as for these questions, I, I really don't know what to say, because um, we, you're asking questions which uh, hit at the very heart of our education system where um, it, it, you know, I have sat in, in, in university uh, uh, faculty meetings 
where uh, they seem to be actually wondering how to catch the student. Aha, you didn't read the textbook. And that seems to be the object of the, you know, uh, well, too bad. I kept saying, well, you know, they're in college and you can't force them to, if they don't want to read it, let them not read it. But to say, what did X in the story say to Y? And that's the answer. I mean, that kind of idiocy has to be stopped. You know, um, uh, there are ways of improving memory, which is a good thing to have uh, a good memory. But um, that's that's not the point. I think I think uh, a, a couple of questions which are suggested to the teacher. Because it's the teacher who has to learn, not the student, about how to elicit interest from the students. Because, of course, you know, all of us adults can, can never, we have to unlearn so much. And that is the process of learning. So to say, well, you know, how does this uh, affect uh, students here? You know, or something completely crazy. Okay, if Gandhi were to arrive in your town today, what would he have to say about this? Whatever has happened, you know, about the story. So to to sort of, move the take give the mic to the children and say you know uh, that's one way that's one way of course i don't go and teach in a classroom every day so you might well have people saying yes yes it's very easy for you to sit there and hold forth try and do it <laughs> but you know this is we're talking about what is desirable and what is actually achieved in a day to day basis but i agree to have those those questions and those fill in the blanks at the end are terrible <laughs> mm. Ma'am, there are several, uh, several interesting, very interesting questions coming up, but then uh, we really don't have time. I'll, I'll send you a list of them. Uh, if you get time, I'll be really grateful if you could write that down, type that down. I'll share it with the participants. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah, I'm sorry about uh, not getting enough time. You you have a lot of questions, really good ones. I'll post it to her. Thank you very much, participants. Now, everybody, please turn on your camera. Let's just freeze this moment. Gita Bam will go for a quick picture with all our participants. So Anikha, Anugraha, Deeksha and Trinita, please click. Oh, that's a lovely frame. I hope you have clicked. I'll share it our group. Uh, thank you very much, Gita, ma'am. It was such a delight. And uh, I, I, I'm really happy that you agreed uh, to be with us. Such a wonderful introductory remark. We can't ask for a better start for the program. Really, truly, mm. I, I absolutely loved it. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank yeah, you. so thank you uh, for listening so patiently. <laughs> oh ma'am, it was it was such an academic delight. How how else would we start? It was really wonderful. Um, I can see so many reactions, you know, hearts popping out and claps coming up. So thank you very much for uh, on behalf of the entire uh, you know academic community who are here. Thank you so much, Kida ma'am. Um, I'll contact you after some time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, Paro ma'am is also here. Thank you, ma'am, for staying in. <laughs> yes. Um, so, dear participants, we'll just take a five minutes break. Uh, enjoy some music. Um, I'll come back. Uh, I'll contact the next speaker. Next is uh, Ms. Deepa Kiran, uh, who is a professional storyteller. So, take a quick break. Have a cup of coffee. I can't give you. So, just grab it and uh, please be ready for the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs> 